Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 12 and our final lesson for this quarter is titled Rewards of Faithfulness and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath, March 25. Sabbath afternoon, March 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that during this series of lessons we've got to know more about who you are and what you want from us in our relationship with you. And as we conclude this series of lessons, Rewards of Faithfulness is our title this week, we just thank you that you are faithful and that you encourage us to be faithful as well. And Lord, one day we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things, and you will give your answer for each of us. And wherever we're listening today, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide and to bless as we open your word. May your name be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And just a little note for those of you who are listening. This is being recorded outdoors. Um, my daughter took me away for a holiday. And uh, I'm on the banks of the Elliot River in Queensland, near the city of Bundaberg. And uh, I'm sitting under a a beautiful mimosa tree and uh, you'll probably hear crickets in the background and a butcher bird going caw, caw, every so often um, and there may be a chainsaw in the distance because there's some construction going on a house about half a mile away but let's get to the word today our memory text today is Matthew 25 verse 21 his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 25, verse 21. Let's read that again. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Though we can never earn salvation, the Bible uses the hope of reward as a motivation for faithful living as undeserving recipients of God's grace. For in the end, whatever we receive is always and only from God's grace. As David said, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11. In various places, the Bible talks about our rewards, what we are promised through Christ after the second coming, and this terrible detour with sin is once and for all over and done. What are we promised? And what assurance do we have of getting what we have been promised? Sunday, March 19, Reward for Faithfulness. Read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. What should this verse mean to us? How should we respond to what it says? Also read Revelation 22 verse 12, Isaiah 40 verse 10, and Isaiah 62 verse 11. What do all these texts teach us? First of all, Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then we look at Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. And Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 10. 
Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work be for him. And finally, Isaiah 62 and verse 11. That's Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work be for him. What do all these texts teach us? The reward from God to his faithful children is unique, and like many spiritual things, may be beyond our finite understanding. As we read in the Great Controversy, page 674, Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. End of quote. Jesus concluded the Beatitudes, which opened the Sermon on the Mount, with these words in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kind of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 5 verses 11 and 12. After listing the people of faith in Hebrews 11, Paul begins the next chapter explaining why Jesus was willing to die on the cross in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Being rewarded for faithfulness, however, is not the same as salvation by works. Who among us, or among any of the characters in the Bible, had works good enough to give them any merit before God? None, of course. That's the whole point of the cross. If we could have saved ourselves by works, Jesus never would have gone to the cross. Instead, it must be by grace, as we read in Romans 11 verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. Rewards instead are the mere outworking of what God has done for us and in us. And so to finish today, how do we understand the difference between salvation by grace and a reward according to works? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Monday, March 20 everlasting life and today we're back in the studio at home it's much quieter here as human beings and whether we like it or not an eternity awaits us and according to the bible this eternity will come in one of two manifestations at least for each of us individually either eternal life or eternal death that's it no middle ground no straddling a bit one side or another Instead, it is one life or the other death. This truly is a case of all or nothing. Read Romans 6.23 and John 3.16. What options are presented to us? Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is hard to imagine two starker or more distinct choices, isn't it? Chances are that if you're reading this, you have chosen eternal life, or certainly are thinking about it. 
God has the unique ability to do whatever he says he can do, to fulfil all his promises. Our part is simply to believe him, rest upon the merits of Jesus, and by faith obey his word. Read John 14 verses 1 to 3. What is the Lord's counsel to us in verse 1, and what does he promise to us in verses 2 and 3? John 14, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also." In the final days of his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke these amazing words of hope and courage to his disciples. These words would lift their spirits in times of discouragement and trial. They should do the same for us. Jesus came from heaven, went back to heaven, and has promised us in John 14 verse 3, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, so you can be with me there. And perhaps more than anything else, Christ's death on the cross at his first coming is our greatest assurance of his second coming, for without the second coming, what good was his first one? As sure as we are that Jesus died for us on the cross, is as sure as we can be that, yes, as he promised, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Dwell upon the idea that Christ's first coming is the guarantee of his second. What happened at this coming that makes his second a promise that we can trust? Tuesday, March 21, the New Jerusalem. The biblical description of the New Jerusalem is what Abraham saw by faith. For as it says in Hebrews 11.10, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The New Jerusalem is God's masterpiece, built for those who love him and keep his commandments. The New Jerusalem will be the home of God's faithful children in heaven during the millennium and afterward on the new earth for eternity. There is good news for those of us who don't like packing or moving. God takes care of everything. John says he saw the city in chapter 21 of Revelation and verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Read Revelation chapter 21. What are some of the things that we are promised? Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people." God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, one hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was like pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honour of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's so much here that our minds can barely comprehend, damaged as they are by sin, and knowing only a fallen, sin-wracked world. But what we can understand is so full of hope. First, just as Jesus dwelt with us in this fallen world when he came in the flesh, he will dwell with us in the new one. What a privilege it must have been for those who saw Jesus up close and personal. We will have that opportunity only now without the veil of sin distorting what we see. Then, too, how do we who only know tears and sorrow and crying and pain understand one of the greatest promises in all the Bible? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In verse 4. All those former things will have passed away, things that never should have been here to begin with. Also, flowing from the throne of God is the pure river of life, and on either side of the river is the tree of life. God's throne will be there, and they shall see his face. We read in Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Again, the redeemed will live with a closeness to God that, for the most part, we don't have now. So to finish the day, read Revelation 21, verse 8, about the fate of those who will face the second death. Let's read that before we continue.
But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Which sin of those depicted there could not have been forgiven by Jesus? Why, then, are these people lost when some who have done the same things are saved? What is the crucial difference between these two groups? Wednesday, March 22. The Settling of Accounts Near the close of Jesus' ministry, his disciples came to him privately and asked, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? That's Matthew 24, verse 3. Jesus then takes two chapters to answer their questions. Chapter 24 tells of signs in the world around us, such as wars, disasters, and so on. Then Matthew 25 talks about conditions in the church just before Jesus comes again. These conditions are illustrated by three stories, one of which is the parable of the talents, which talks about how God's people have used the gifts that he has given to them. Read Matthew 25, verses 14 to 19. Who is the one travelling into a far country? To whom does he entrust his goods? What does it mean to settle accounts, as it says in verse 19? Well, let's start at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man travelling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So, sometimes we think of talents as natural gifts, such as singing, speaking, and so on. But in the similar story of the miners in Luke 19, verses 12 to 24, money and its management are specifically mentioned. Let's read that in Luke 19, verses 12 to 24. Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten miners, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your miner has earned ten miners. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your miner has earned five miners. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your miner, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared, because you are an austere man, you collect what you do not deposit, and reap what you do not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the miner from him, and give it to him who has ten miners. Ellen White also stated, I was shown that the parable of the talents has not been fully understood. This important lesson was given to the disciples for the benefit of Christians living in the last days. 
and these talents do not represent merely the ability to preach and instruct from the Word of God. The parable applies to the temporal means which God has entrusted to his people. And that's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 197. Read Matthew 25, verses 20 to 23. What does God say to those who are faithful money managers in supporting his cause? What does it mean to enter into the joy of your Lord, as it says in verse 23? Well, let's begin Matthew 25 at verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. It is quite natural for us to think that another person has more talents than we have and is therefore more responsible to God. In this story, however, it is the person with only one talent, the least money, who proved unfaithful and lost the kingdom. Rather than to think of the responsibilities of others, let us focus on what God has entrusted to us and how we can use it to his glory. And so to finish today, how are you going to fare when God comes to settle accounts with you? Thursday, March 23, Eyes on the Prize After Paul's conversion, he dove fully into the cause of Christ. Because of his education and sharp mind, he could have been very successful from a worldly perspective. Like Moses, Paul chose to suffer with God's faithful children and for the sake of Christ. He suffered beatings, stonings, prison, shipwreck, hunger, cold and more as recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 24 to 33. How was he able to endure all of this? Let's read 2 Corinthians 11 24 to 33. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through the window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Read Romans chapter 8, verses 16 to 18. How was the knowledge that he was a child of God a factor in his faithfulness? Romans 8, beginning at verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
The value Paul placed on the reward of the faithful is what kept him excited about suffering for Christ. He wrote from prison in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 12 which we have looked at already, but is worth coming back to. What is the crucial message in these verses, especially for us as Christians? So the sixth chapter of First Timothy, and we begin at verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. From the biblical perspective, prosperity is having what you need when you need it. It is not the accumulation of possessions. Prosperity also is claiming the promise of God in Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Finally, prosperity is to be thankful for what you have in the Lord and trust in him in all things. God does not promise his children that they will all be rich in this world's goods. In fact, he says that all who live godly lives shall suffer persecution. What he does offer is better than any worldly wealth. He says, I will supply your needs, and wherever you go, I will be with you. Then, in the end, he will give his faithful ones true wealth and responsibility and eternal life. What an awesome reward! Near the end of his life, Paul was able to say, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. May we all, through God's grace, be able to say the same thing, and with the same assurance as well. Friday, March 24. Further Thought here is a word picture of a church family who were financially faithful managers of God's business on earth. The stewardship vision for Seventh-day Adventist churches around the world. It's some time in the future, and pastors and local church leaders have been successful at creating a stewardship environment in the church. They have taught, trained, supported and encouraged the church family in biblical financial management. People are implementing biblical principles in their lives. They are growing in generosity, saving on a regular basis for the unexpected and moving out from under the bondage of consumer debt. Their lifestyles are marked by moderation, discipline and contentment. Money has been eliminated as the rival God and they are growing in their relationship with the Creator God. It's Sabbath morning and people are arriving for services. 
In their demeanour is a sense of peace, a lack of anxiety over financial matters, a pervading sense of contentment and gratefulness. Marital conflict over money has been largely eliminated. They enter worship with a sense of anticipation and expectation of God's presence and work among them. The church's ministries are fully funded and it has a strong outreach. It extends the love of Christ in very tangible ways to those in need. Funds have been made available to provide church facilities that wonderfully support ministry and that are maintained with excellence. The question before us all is, what is God calling us to do with whatever resources he has entrusted to us? And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, in class, talk about the question of how we are to understand two very clear biblical teachings. Salvation by faith and a reward according to works. How do we harmonise these two concepts? Two, why does learning to be content with what we have now not mean that we can't seek to better our financial position? That is, why are these ideas not necessarily in conflict? And three, there is no question that eternity awaits us. What choices do we make now, even little ones, that will help determine where we will spend that eternity? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Treasure in Old Vessels by John Kakanzi. Thirteen-year-old Precious cried out in frustration as her father led her through the gates of a Seventh-day Adventist boarding school in Uganda. She wanted to study in the stately buildings of the school associated with her family's denomination, not in the modest buildings of Katera Primary School. It's not the magnificence but the academic excellence that matters, my daughter, father whispered into her ear. He said her preferred school had not performed well academically for the past three years. Precious bit her tongue, but her face showed her unhappiness as father enrolled her at the school. When father waved goodbye at the gate, her tears flowed freely. Why has my beloved dad chosen to imprison me in the name of schooling, she blurted out. This is ridiculous. Hello, come, a smiling woman said in a kind voice. Let's go to the dormitory and I'll show you where to sleep. Precious sadly followed as the woman carried her mattress and suitcase to the dormitory. That evening, her heart sank further when she saw students lining up outside an old building. She wondered what was happening until she saw the students carrying plates of food. She realised that it was the cafeteria. That evening, she ate a vegetarian meal for the first time in her life. Later, Precious heard a bell ringing and saw students running joyfully to the campus chapel for evening worship. She decided to return to the dormitory, but the doors were closed. She returned to the chapel and stood on its porch, unsure about what to do. Come, let's enter the house of the Lord, the same smiling woman said. It's prayer time, don't be sad. Precious felt loved, and she entered the chapel. Immediately her sadness vanished inside. She had never heard such beautiful singing. She also marvelled at the orderly and interesting 30-minute worship service that followed the singing. At least I will enjoy this part of the school, she thought. Father didn't return until the end of the school term. He had feared that Precious would refuse to stay if he came earlier. He was surprised when she announced that she wanted to return to the school. She said she did not want to miss the kind teachers who began every lesson with a prayer and a Bible text and who offered practical advice whenever she faced challenges. The next term, the school held a week of prayer, and Precious gave her heart to Jesus in baptism. Surely a school is more than its buildings, she told me, the pastor who led the week of prayer. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will assist six Adventist schools in the East Central African Division, including in Precious's homeland of Uganda. Thank you for your generous offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.